live from Singapore. This is Insight with me, Haslinda Amin, where we div dive deeper into stories that matter with crucial context and sharp analysis. Another magnificent seven-member dazzles investors as Alphabet beats expectations. However, chipmaker AMD disappoints, sowing some doubts about the AI boom. We'll get you market calls this hour from GQG Partners. We'll discuss their outlook for NVIDIA and their reaction to the Adani Group flagship's more than 600% jump in profit. Also ahead, an exclusive interview with the chairman of India's biggest car maker, Maruti Suzuki, after it misses profit estimates, with the country's automobile demand remains stuck in low gear. Also, as we close in on the U.S. elections, investors are rushing to safety, sending gold to a record. Bitcoin also closing in an all-time high, betting on a Trump win. We'll speak to control risks later with a pre-poll analysis. A rally in big tech pushing U.S. stocks higher. Avril Hong on top of the story. Avril, it is about Max 7. It is about data centers. It is about cloud. Oh, it is about AI, Haas, to your point. And somehow, about a week before the U.S. election and a Fed meeting, the Nasdaq managing to clock a fresh all-time high at 18,712. And this is after an already impressive 25% gain so far this yeah, but the question remains, can some of these MAG-7s and NASDAQ you know, justify uh, their lofty valuations given their earnings? So far, among the first of the MAG-7s to report this week, yes, they can. Take a look at Alphabet and how it really beat expectations, revenue surpassed forecasts, and it's showing how its expensive AI foray is helping uh, to lift growth and, you know, it's really paying off. It's helping its cloud growth as well as its search engine business. Uh, you see how the revenue for the third quarter, I think it climbed like 16% to about $75 billion. But if you look at the AMD, the chip maker earnings, that's when the AI outlook becomes a bit less clear because for the fourth quarter, revenue forecast that miss estimates. And if you look at how it's performing versus the market leader NVIDIA, it's trailing really far behind in terms of the uh, sales forecast for the year. Part of the growth for AMD is so supply constraints, uh, but you also think to how if its clients uh, don't see AI just yet as a big uh, money maker, can they then justify big spending on chips? Haas? Avril Hong, thank you. Let's bring in Brian Cashman, Portfolio Manager at GQG Partners, which has more than $160 billion in assets under management and is well known for making big contrarian bets. Good to have you with us. I'm just wondering, when you take a look at uh, the picture out of Alphabet, out of AMD, it's pretty mixed. Risk, reward. How are you assessing the Max 7 now? Yes, I think risk reward is the kind of the key, you know, thing to, to ask yourself in these situations. Um, when we go back to earlier this year, we, we had a very large weighting to a lot of these tech names, um, specifically NVIDIA and a lot of the MAG-7 overall. Um, and we did actually adjust some of these back over the course of the year um, because they've done well. Um, and, and we did adjust back, uh, you know, from risk management standpoint, but we still like them. Uh, so you like NVIDIA, I think it's a fantastic story. I think that they are garnering and sort of, you know, sucking in a lot of the CapEx um, within sort of the AI ecosystem, within the tech spending ecosystem. So then it just becomes a matter of the haves and the have nots and, who, and where you want to sort of uh, place your, your calls, so to speak, and where the risk reward is uh, more favorable. So it's become a little bit more stock by stock there. You talk about how you like NVIDIA. I mean, how much more upside? We had Masayoshi San saying that, you know what, when it comes to NVIDIA, it's all, it's currently underpriced. So what's the upside? How do you play it going forward? 
Yeah, so if, if you ask, uh, you know, Jensen Wong, Jensen Wong will tell you there's a trillion dollars in data center <laughs> spending that will continue to be, uh, you know, sold. And the only feasible solution is to buy GPUs and, you know, self, uh, you know, pro proclaiming that, you know, the, the NVIDIA GPUs are the, the, you know, the best mousetrap. I think they are uh, a better mousetrap than sort of the, uh, you know, like a, an AMD equivalent right now. It doesn't mean AMD has a, a terrible product, but NVIDIA does have a, a great product from a hardware perspective. Um, but I think it's the software side of things on top of that as well. Um, you know, the CUDA, the language that sits on top of that, that helps control and sort of optimize that ecosystem, makes the performance of everything else around it else, uh, you know, those other things better. Um, and then the software stacks that they're building on top, it's increasingly becoming a software story over time as well. So does that drive a little bit more secular growth over, over the course of time? Uh, it, it, perhaps it does. Um, so that's, that's something that I think is uh, continue to be interesting. But again, it's all about the managing that risk award. And you know, we, we had a very large position in this name uh, earlier in the year, have dialed it back a little bit um, because we, we are managing that risk. And quite frankly, we're finding other interesting areas um, that are, are you know, giving us a uh, you know, pretty good return from a risk rewards perspective. What other areas? What's looking interesting? Where are you putting your money? So ironically, I think uh, some of the more interesting areas tend to be uh, maybe boring <laughs> by classic sort of investment <laughs> standards. Um, so if you if you do need uh, you know sort of all this AI investment that's going on, um, we have seen um, that with all the renewable power uh, that has been brought online, a lot of these different areas that quite frankly baseload power has been underinvested. Um, and then you put in sort of the AI uh, sort of aspects of power generation, things like that, as sort of a call option on top of that. So some of the utilities, uh, you know, are actually a little bit more interesting at this point in time, even in the developed market context, and gets you that high single digit, low double digit return, maybe with a dividend, getting you to more of a, a teens type of return for a really interesting uh, sort of a compelling return. Energy is another one. I, I know folks uh, kind of are a little bit downbeat on sort of the, the supply outlook and how much supply could come online for energy. Um, but if you do believe that there is sort of a, a soft landing scenario um, that the economy is going to do okay, you can't necessarily believe some of the oil prices. I mean, Brent crude is essentially where we were five years ago. It's the only commodity that I can think of, uh, you know, in large scale that's basically the same price with all this inflation that's happened over the course of time. And these companies are returning cash back to shareholders and we're getting right. you know, really good returns in the meantime. Uh, Brian, getting back to Mac 7, some say that it is an overcrowded trade. When everybody starts getting in, it's actually time to get out. I mean, when do you start thinking about getting out? Yeah, so I think when expectations get a little bit too lofty, and, and again, that's part of that risk management. Where is the spending going to continue to come from? And what we do know um, is on sort of the advertising, the ad, ad tech side of things, that is where the spending does continue to come through. We saw that from some of the results today, um, you know, from, from Alphabet after the close. Um, we, we think there's some other plays that are that are really interesting on that side. You see that backed up, by the way, by the ad agency revenue models uh, and, and sort of those players as well, that there is real spending and returns happening there. But there is a little bit of a question mark in terms of where the returns are going to come from outside of there. So you have to think about that hyperscaler group, how much investment does continue to come through, and you just manage the risk. Um, we're in the business of taking on risk as, uh, as investors. It's how you manage that risk and sort of adjust that profile over the course of time. Um, that's, that's our job as, a, as an investor. There's also that big question mark when it comes to the U.S. election, how that might play out, whether it's Trump, whether it's Harris. How might a Trump administration impact how the Max 7 performs? Where do you see, uh, you know, those stocks trading after the election? So this is an interesting one because, you know, one of the, the sort of expressions I like to use here, especially when it comes to elections, is it's never as good as it seems and it's never as bad as it seems. <laughs> no, no matter which party you're, you're looking for to, to sort of win this, um, I think you, you end up getting a little bit more watered down policies by the time sort of these, uh, you know, the, these elections come through and, and the actual rubber hits the road, so to speak, with, with the policies coming through and sort of Congress passing and the executive branch that are going through these initiatives. Um, you've seen that in elections in the past where the, the policies that were promised during the election campaigns in 2016, 2020, um, they became a lot more watered down and it's more business as usual um, than, than you would have expected. Um, you even see that with trade policies. So you think about where are the areas where you're definitely seeing you know, both sides are actually going to push in the same direction. Um, U.S. China trade policy, you know, that was doubled down, you know, it, it, under the last administration. I would expect that to continue to go further in terms of restrictions there. Um, and I would also, you know, you know argue that um, 
uh, you know, in, in terms of inflation, both sides are going to have some inflationary impacts. You know, if the Democrats win, it's probably through, uh, you know, some sort of you know, subsidy programs and entitlement programs and things along those lines. If the Republicans win, it'll be through tax cuts and things like that. So those are both inflationary. And I'm not sure that the market is fully priced that in at this point in time, too. Right. But if you if you had to hazard a guess, Brian, I mean, which are the AI winners and losers, and what's a safe bet if there is such a thing for post-election? Yeah. So again, we're in the business of preparing, not predicting. But if I were to say, you know, anything, it would be to follow the earnings. Where are the earnings coming through? Uh, you know, most vigorously. Who is taking advantage of sort of the situation at this point in time, and uh, you know, driving most of those returns? And those are companies like an Nvidia. Um, I would also cite like a TSMC, uh, more of the emerging market side of things. Uh, you think of them as sort of the picks and shovels, no matter who wins. By the way, if we're wrong about NVIDIA and AMD does better, or you know, some of these ASICs, these custom ASICs end up doing a little bit better, TSMC is uh, you know the, the foundry for everybody. Um, so they're going to continue to win, and you're getting that, again, for a very reasonable multiple for the type of growth that you're getting out of that almost monopolistic type of business. So that's another area that I think no matter who wins on either side, uh, we'll, we'll continue to sort of power forward. Right. Uh, is there a sense perhaps that investors are underprepared for a Trump clean sweep? Yeah, so I think you're seeing that the markets are starting to sort of appreciate uh, maybe a clean sweep and sort of preparing for, for Trump coming in. Again, our job is to kind of sit back and say, OK, well, what will do well regardless and sort of make those adjustments kind of going on along those lines as we continue to press forward. Um, so that's really what we're looking at at this point in time. Um, we like certainty of earnings in a lot of the names. Again, some of the more boring names are the ones that are coming a little bit more reasonable valuations outside of sort of this tech ecosystem. And quite frankly, some of the growthier opportunities are, are really coming still from the emerging markets, regardless of who sort of is president uh, and sort of who comes through. Um, and I'll cite, you know, India being one of those areas. So you can get some really strong returns out of an infrastructure or a utility company. We're talking 20, 30, even 40 percent growth keggers. Um, top line growth and then also earnings growth out of these businesses. I, I think in the, in the developed markets, we're not used to seeing those types of numbers out of an infrastructure utility company. And that's that's kind of what we're seeing. So we're, we're very bullish in the prospects of a lot of things we're seeing in India right now. All right. So boring ain't bad. We'll be talking about India. Brian standing pat there. Brian Kirschman, portfolio manager at GQG Partners, is sticking around. Well, still ahead this hour, we'll get insights on the U.S. election from global consultancy control risks. Hear why they think an enthusiasm advantage might just tip a tight race in favor of Kamala Harris. And we'd like to hear from all our viewers. So we've put together a short online survey. Scan the QR code on your screen right now to, the, to tell us what you'd like to see more on Bloomberg TV and any other suggestions for improvement. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Adani Enterprises has posted a more than 660% jump in profit for its latest quarter, fueled by strong showings from its airport's new energy units. That overcame a drag from its coal trading business. Shares rose on Tuesday after those results. Let's bring in uh, Brian uh, Kirschman, portfolio manager at GQG Partners, who is still with us. GQG is a big investor in Adani stock. So a good bet there. How much more upside? I mean, how are you interpreting those earnings numbers? Yeah, so I think what is interesting about uh, is just the infrastructure environment in general within India and the utility you know, environment in general in India is that there is a long runway ahead of these folks. Uh, no, no pun intended, there are airport you know, infrastructure assets that we're talking about here as well. But there's a long runway ahead of a lot of these uh, names on a go forward basis. If you think of like Adani Green. Adani Green, for example, is looking to build 30 gigawatts of solar energy. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, 50 gigawatts of, of solar energy you know, over the course of the, the next several years to 2030. I mean, that is a next era size, you know, portfolio of very, you know renewable energy portfolio, uh, and you're seeing you know massive, massive growth from a you know, a, you know an expansion standpoint and a revenue, and they're doing it profitably as well. Um, so that is very exciting for us. I think there's an incredibly long runway, 2030, 40-year concession contract. 
contracts that are on the back end of, of some of these arrangements over the course of time. Um, and, and we're very excited for the, the continued headroom for, for growth in a lot of these names, not just the Adani names, the names outside of there, but Adani has a particular, uh, you, know, you know, interesting execution sort of strategy and their ability to sort of bring all these different units together and, and leverage uh, right. you know, all those synergies across the board. So in terms of the Adani group, right, I mean, I'm just wondering whether there's reason for you to start thinking about uh, piling on your investments. I mean, you know, when it comes to enterprises as well as green, they're contributing to among your top 10 holdings. Yeah, so what, you know, we, when we first initially invested in these names in Q1 of last year, um, initially made a, a 1.9 billion dollar stake across the firm, um, and, and you know added a little bit more, so called about 4.3 billion was more or less the initial stake. Um, we you know continue to see you know the, the earnings come through these businesses, uh, and most of the, the increase from there has actually been from capital appreciation. So the, the actual names continue to run really well. Now we like what we're seeing from the earnings perspective. Perspective. We continue to come back more bullish, and uh, you know when we see all the different data prints that come out from the various businesses. So it's not just green; it's also the infrastructure assets, the power assets, which are also growing. You know, thermal power is also growing 20 plus percent on an annualized basis. Continue to like what we see. Um, so we hold about 10 billion uh, in assets, uh, you know, for across the different Adani groups at this point in time. Um, but again, consider that against you know the 160 billion that we hold across the board. So um, although it sounds like a lot, it's, it's still a fairly modest stake in the grand scheme of things. Of course, we saw that $2 billion bet last April. Rajiv Jain said back then that it is uh, a multi-bagger. How is that playing out, you think? Yeah, so it, it has been a tremendous investment up until this point. And I think the initial stage of that was sort of the recovery from that U.S. based short report uh, and sort of that, that bounce back that you've seen there. But then again, um, we, we have the slogan, you know, at GQG, earnings are like gravity. Um, you know, the, the, the stock price will gravitate towards the earnings trajectory of these businesses. And again, as I had said before, the, the growth of these and the durability and the headroom for growth of these. I mean, these are like software-like growth trajectories, but you're also getting the visibility and the durability from sort of a more of a utility-like asset over the course of time. So uh, we think there's tremendous headroom for, for continued growth here, and we're, we're very excited. Um, that's not the only area that we're interested in on the EM side as well. I would argue that the UAE and uh, Saudi is also incredibly interesting, um, particularly the UAE. If you look at some of the, the property names, for example, that have reported uh, you know recently, like an Altar, um, you know, putting up tremendous, tremendous growth, uh, you know, 60 plus percent growth in terms of the you know, year over year growth and again headroom uh, for continued growth as they continue to expand and, and sort of build these properties as UAE um, you know becomes almost like Singapore uh, and, and you know what that transformation that happened there um, where it becomes mm. almost this financial and business hub within the Middle East um, linking sort of the, you know, the the wealthy folks coming from India you know coming over to Singapore and then also um, as more folks sort of you know move from you know Hong Kong or Singapore to sort of the UAE we're, we're seeing mm. tremendous amounts of growth and opportunity there as well. Brian, before I pick up on the UAE and other emerging markets, just to finish, finish up our conversation on Adani, as a group, when you take a look at the stocks, they've not done much since the election, despite uh, those good earnings numbers. I'm just wondering, how are you reading into this? What would be the next catalyst that would convince investors, uh, you know, otherwise that growth is there? Yeah, so again, I think the numbers continue to come through. The data continues to come through in a broad swath that you kind of quoted and cited sort of the Downey Enterprises numbers that, that came through you know, very recently as well. Um, again, the investors will, will continue to see that. I think you'll continue to see the excitement there. Um, India overall has taken a little bit of a pause um, as sort of China has sort of rebounded on a lot of those stimulus measures and sort of hopes, uh, you know, coming through from that side of things. Um, we're a little bit more um, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, you know, agnostic into sort of that recovery in China because it, there is a little bit of a sort of pushing on the string, so to speak. You think about the, the TARP program in the U.S. I mean, that was earmarked to be $700 billion, and that's not nearly what you've seen come out of the Chinese government so far uh, in terms of, you know, the, the, the size of the stimulus plan. And by the way, the U.S. economy, $15 trillion back then, is not too far off from the $12 trillion Chinese economy now. Uh, so we think there's going to be more effort that needs to be done from, from that standpoint. Um, so we're, we're a 
little bit more, uh, you know, uh, uh, cautious in terms of this recovery. And again, continue to to look at where are the earnings coming through across the emerging markets, the Middle East, uh, you right. know, UAE. Is yeah, sorry. Yeah. You talked about how you're really excited about India, but we're seeing outflows, in fact, poised for a record monthly outflow uh, this month, and some say it is uh, headed towards China. How are you looking at this? I mean, is there a, uh, a sense, perhaps, that when you take a look at the stretch valuations, India's actually looking less attractive? Yeah, so I think there are pockets that are looking a little bit less attractive. And I think if you take sort of the, the global investor base, there are certain stocks, there are certain names that folks will tend to go to um, within India. And I think some of those do have some stretch valuations. You think about um, sort of the, you know, the you know, technology service companies, um, you know, those types of businesses. You, you talk about maybe some of the refining companies, the, the bigger names that are out there. Um, those have not necessarily you know, you know, done quite as well and maybe a little bit stretched in terms of valuation consumer staples as well. Um, but even outside of the Adani group, you have telecom names, for example, where they're seeing 19% plus growth in terms of service revenue from India. So you're seeing a lot of this growth happen in a lot of areas. The, these stocks are tending to take a pause after a very strong run over the course of time. But again, it's the fundamentals that we, we continue to go back to and we believe that continues to carry the debt. From a portfolio perspective, though, it is interesting to see that people are you know, increasingly talking about taking money out of India, putting it in China, or taking money out of China, putting it in India. I mean, is that, is that the trend that can be expected going forward? Is this what we're looking at when it comes to portfolio construction? Yeah, so I, I think when you think about sort of generalist investors across the board, maybe a little bit of that is happening. Um, we are seeing a lot of domestic flows sort of inbound within India. Um, so we do see some strong support there overall. Um, and I think it's a little bit more marginal on the edges in terms of when you look at the sort of the global generalists in, in terms of those different directions back and forth. Um, you did see an initial surge on the Chinese side of things um, with some of those stocks, um, the, the initial excitement, um, some of the hedge fund community and things like that were really sort of going into those. Uh, but it seems like some of that has been unwound since um, and it's been a little bit uh, slower of an uptake from the the uh, sort of the long only community uh, and then it's been the local investors in China that have been a little bit more sort of excited but again the, the data has to back this up now I'm not saying we don't like China. We actually do have some investments on that side of things. We're a little bit more modestly postured in our EM portfolio, we'll call it 11, 12% exposure. But they're tending to be more of the SOE types of names. Um, we actually think that this is an area where the government is at your back. So if I can buy a sort of government sponsored monopoly or oligopoly um, that aligns with the government interests. So if you think about energy, you think about materials and those types of names, getting high single digit dividend yields, uh, and single digit sort of uh, you know, PE multiples, and very strong growth, arguably better than the platform companies over the past five years. That's more of what we're interested at this point in time. Um, that's what we're finding interesting out of the, the Chinese perspective. Um, a little bit more mixed in terms of the, the platform names, um, where we're just looking for better growth and seeing better growth in other areas that are a little bit less right. appreciated. You talk about how China is a tactical play. When you take a look at the money moving into China, is that mainly tactical play? Yeah, so I think that initial surge again. I have a you know an eighty thousand foot view here from from my seat, but I think that initial surge was a little bit more of that sort of tactical play. You saw folks sort of jumping in on really depressed valuations. Again, the way we operate, we don't buy things purely on sentiment. We don't buy things just because we're cheap. We buy things because we like the earnings trajectories of the business, and then if it's sufficiently inexpensive on top of that, that is that is great for us. Um, so it's a little bit harder for us to participate in those types of rallies. To the extent that the data does come through, we do start to see this follow through in terms of earnings, consumers really picking up the pace. Um, we're, we're happy to jump in. But again, I think that's a hard engine to get going after going through a lot of the sort of economic downturn that China's gone through, the property market really struggling um, to really come back to life. It, it's really hard to just lower interest rates and throw a little bit of stimulus at that and really get that ignited and going again over the course of time. So it's, it's more of a wait and see and we'll adjust as the data comes through. And it is about fundamentals. Brian, been a pleasure. Brian Cushman, Portfolio Manager at GQG Partners. Well, still to come, top Indian car maker Maruti Suzuki reports a profit miss on weak local demand. We'll get insights later. This is Bloomberg. what Donald Trump has in mind. More chaos, 
more division, and policies that help those at the very top and hurt everyone else. I offer a different path, and I ask for your vote. The problem is, if we had more of these idiots running our country, you won't have a big and best market anymore because we're a nation in decline. We're going to turn that around. So you're going to be so proud of this country. And Presidential candidates Donald Trump and Kamala Harris speaking as we head into the final week of the U.S. election campaign. And Bitcoin's been edging closer to regaining a record high of almost $74,000, which is seen as investors betting on a Trump victory. Gold also touching a record high on potential market volatility. While the election outcome is likely to be extremely close, our next guest believes Vice President Harris retains an edge. Let's bring in Angela Mancini, partner at Control Risks a global risk consultancy. Good to have you with us, Angela. Great to be here. The race is so tight. It's very tight. In fact, it's probably one of the tightest we've ever seen in U.S. history. And I will say, you know, what's extraordinary is we've seen two assassination attempts. We've seen Biden step down. We've seen a host of these really market-moving events in the last months. And the polls still stay quite uh, stable. So we even have, have been having events, as we know, with Madison Square Garden rally that Trump put on. Kamala Harris spoke just a few hours ago in D.C., had record crowds in D.C., the polls aren't really moving. So it's it's very close to cause, really coin toss. But if pressed, control risk call is that it's it's Harris, but with a very narrow uh, narrow win. And of course, there's caveats in that. But to be honest, we're Why? helping clients Why prepare for Why would it be a win for Harris? So here's the thing. There has indeed been a vibe shift, let's call it, in the last weeks, where it feels like, and of course, the prediction markets, which don't really mean anything, see, the, you know, the, the narrative seems to be favoring Trump. But if you look at the structure behind the actual get out the vote, it's really strong for Harris. She has more money. She has more volunteers. She's got probably the best get out the vote ground campaign in history. She's got all the Obama people who really, you know, built that structure out and what good looks like. And she's got really strong enthusiasm from supporters. So if you look at even at her money, so she's got over $2 billion she's raised. If you look at that, that's a lot of small donors. If you look at Trump's money, which is about a billion, four, $400,000 comes from four people, or $400 million, rather. So he does have a lot of big donors, Elon Musk, we've heard all about that. But he doesn't have as many real small donor you know, body there to support him. That is pretty interesting because people talk about the battle of the billionaires and the yes. billionaires might just move the needle. You disagree? Well, I do think there's something to be said for the billionaires that are affiliated with the media. If you look at Elon Musk, he does have the ability to drive the narrative through X. If you look at Jeff Bezos, very controversial that the Washington Post has, uh, for the first time in history, said we're not going to actually endorse either candidate, which has caused a number of the Washington Post editorial board to, to resign. So there is uh, momentum and narrative changing that they can do with that money. But if you look at the enthusiasm, again, it's not just what the polls say, it's who's going to actually vote on that day. Who's going to actually get off the couch, God forbid it's raining, go to the polls and actually vote. And I think Harris does have a better edge. Plus, then you add in the fact she has, a, a, of course, a big advantage when it comes to the abortion issue, which is really a, you know, a big issue, especially for women, of course. That's on the ballot in 10 key states, which again may rally people out to vote. So it's very close to call. It's a very, very hard to call, but she does have the edge, we think. Suffice to say, the world is watching with bated breath and also making preparations. The EU, for example, right? If you take a look at who's in charge of NATO right now, rut, they say, was put in place because he possibly can speak to Trump. What do you make of the arrangements being made right now by the EU, by Asia? So I think, and we've seen this for months and months, I think, of course, business is preparing for both, so are countries. So we see preparations made also at the government levels for both. And to be, what's, what's so fascinating about this whole situation is it's so close, but what is on offer is so vastly different, especially when it comes to relations with NATO or relations bilaterally with other countries. So I do think there's a concern, of course, from NATO if Trump's elected. I don't think there's a, a thought that Trump would actually withdraw the U.S. from NATO, but as we have he seen before, before, he has threatened, but probably we would see something more like um, comments around the, that would uh, erode the potential efficacy or viability of NATO, but probably not actually formally withdrawing. But if you know, if you look at his close relationship with Viktor Orban from Hungary, who's of course a NATO member, you know, as 
different NATO members may have stronger relationship to Trump that are more authoritarian, that also calls into question kind of the, the structure and the, again, the efficacy of NATO. So I think it's, I think a lot of people are preparing for that. Deep implications for Asia, in particular relations between the U.S. and China. And of course, there are ripple effects. Don't worry, I mean, don't forget as well, I mean, you know, tensions in the South China Sea, Korean Peninsula. Um, are we prepared for another Trump administration? Are we positioned for that? Yeah, there's no lack of regional hotspots. <laughs> uh, that's exactly true. And each one of those, I would say, is getting more complicated because there's other actors involved. If you look at what's happening right now with North Korea sending troops into potentially, we're hearing, working with Russia to fight the war that's in Ukraine, that is, again, potential game changers. All these regional hotspots are a bit of a tinderbox. Uh, we, do, we don't think any side wants to actively escalate. But there are red lines that may be crossed. And if the, I think the, the key point here is, if you look at a Trump presidency, as we know, it's transactional, it's volatile, it's unpredictable. And if you look at where we were eight years ago, all that unpredictability that really impacted foreign relations, really impacted business, the world is more complicated now than it was before much more interconnectedness, much more challenges across that interconnectedness. So the, the risk is if Trump's in power and brings that same volatility or even maybe worse, what does that then do to the region? So I do think countries and companies are preparing. Well, the thing is, Trump talks about making America great again. And we've seen that before, how that comes at the expense of uh, countries yes. in this part of the world. He's bringing everything back home. Um, in that period when Trump was in power, we saw some changes in terms of supply chains and so on and so forth. Uh, how would you advise businesses in anticipation for that Trump administration? Yeah, so there's a couple things I'd say on that. First of all, from a business point of view, what we've been, Katoros is doing a lot of work on scenario planning for companies. One key thing to remember is not all of those situations impact every company. So that's actually good news. So what we are doing is looking at, okay, what are the scenarios that might unfold? What would the impact be on your specific the global footprint and your supply chains, what are the triggers to watch for, and then how do you monitor those, right? So that's how you would do it from a business standpoint. But I think the interesting thing here as well is indeed companies are, almost all the companies working around Asia have at least a strong regional presence, if not a global presence, and the supply chains have been shifting. It's a lot more complicated than it was last time around. But also if you layer in the um, country's investment perspective as well, so what do I mean by that? If you look at what the Biden administration did with the Inflation Reduction Act, they incented a lot of companies from Korea, from Japan, to invest in the U.S. in semiconductors and clean energy. That investment is potentially called into question if Trump comes to power and rips up the IRA, which he said he would do. But at the same time, let's take the case of Japan. He's threatened to potentially ask them to you know, pay more money at the defense spending as it relates to the U.S. protecting it. But then you actually want Japan on side for your uh, export control you know, uh, plans, and you want them on side as an ally. So it's going to be very complicated if Trump were to come in with the same kind of approach, this very blunt policy tools, to think about how, what does that look like for allies around the region in Asia to comply with what you're asking me for trade and what you're asking me for security, but then you're blocking me to invest in the states and you're cutting off some of my supply chains. Very complicated, not so simple for a Trump approach this time. Implications on the rest of the world, security arrangements, what yeah. would that look like? It's very complicated because again, okay, so if you look at, uh, so if you had a Trump in, in the White House, we've talked a little bit about NATO already. There is a concern, you know, whether NATO, does NATO retain, uh, you know, its same kind of primacy, but also, what happens then if with Ukraine and Russia? So we all know that Trump has a fondness for Vladimir Putin. He said already on record he'd end the war on day one. But what does that actually look like? Does that, does that actually mean the U.S. would stop funding Ukraine? Does that mean that he would try to get the parties together and negotiate something? But what that would then do for a knock-on effect of further Russian aggression across Europe and into NATO countries is unclear. So the, the, I guess the point is, we can look at now at the regional security issues and think about what Trump might do individually, but it's also the knock-on effects and the, you know, the, the planning over time that has the uh, corporate world worried about what does this mean for what, what the architecture is going to look like. We're possibly looking at a warming of relations between China and India mm. with the border issue being yes. looked at right now. How might the U.S. look at this warming of relations between the two sides? Well, it's interesting because the Biden administration, as you know, had this uh, phrase they used, which is we cooperate where we can, we compete where they, we, you know, compete where we must, and we cooperate in things like climate 
climate change and you know, the other types of things. So on paper, the U.S. might say, we're open to everyone cooperating. It's wonderful, actually, especially also for regional security. It is a good thing if China and India are warming ties. However, I think there is a concern, probably from both camps, the Democrats and the Republicans, if you're looking at a country like India and saying, okay, India is a strong member of the Quad. It's also a member of BRICS. And BRICS is expanding, just picked up a few extra members around Southeast Asia as, as um, you know, partner countries. So what does that actually mean? Basically, what does it mean if India, who is working closely with Russia as it relates to trade with oil, but is also a strong U.S. ally, is shifting some of its allegiances? What does that mean for U.S. interests? I think it's something they're watching very closely. Angela, just to make it even more tricky for you, we have India falling out with Canada. Yes, that's... And um, you've got to wonder how this may play out. And some say perhaps China may benefit on the back of that. Well, that's a tricky one because... So the first thing I'd say with the India-Canada issue is there is not yet any evidence, any hard evidence that's been produced by the Trudeau government uh, around what's happened there. If that were to come to, to the fore, I think we'd have a slightly different situation. But I think as it stands now, I think other countries that are looking at that, whether it be the U.S., whether it be other Quad members, I think are looking at that saying, this is an issue, relations may be deteriorating even more between Canada and India, but I don't think anybody wants another flashpoint. I think everyone would be very happy if Canada and India could kind of smooth things over. Again, let's see how it plays out if evidence, uh, you know, with the, with the killing of the Sikh separatist actually comes to the fore. But I think most countries want this to be, stay quite quiet, if at all possible. And, and, and remember, too, I will say, Canada is a big investor in India. India is a great economy to be investing in, particularly in infrastructure and, you know, renewable energies and whatnot. And we've seen a lot of Canadian investment flow in. So there's a lot of investors in Canada that may also want things not to escalate out of control. At this point, though, it's hard to see an end to the spat between the two sides. That's right. Mm. That's right. Angela, thank you. Angela Mancini, partner at Control Risks. Still to come, top Indian car maker Maruti Suzuki reports a profit miss on weak local demand. The chairman joins us exclusively to talk about growth prospects next. And we'd like to hear from all our viewers, so we've put together a short online survey. Scan the QR code on your screen right now. Tell us what you'd like to see more on Bloomberg TV. And of course, any other suggestions for improvement? This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Asia's auto companies are in focus with China's BYD due to report earnings. And earlier, Maruti Suzuki missed estimates. Avril has more on this. Avril, what's expected out of BYD today? Well, has the outlook for China's BYD is really upbeat and analysts think that we could see the company for the first time in terms of quarterly revenues beating Tesla's. And this is, of course, against the backdrop of how the number of vehicles sold have already been doing that, surpassing Tesla's uh, since... Uh, 2022. Uh, and I guess this speaks to the success of the company in turning itself from, you know, one in a sea of many Chinese EV makers to one of the top 10 in the world at the moment. Uh, we are seeing the revenue outlook for this particular quarter. I think it's around uh, $28 billion. If you can take a look at this next page, uh, that will show you what the earnings estimates look like. And this is also a part of how, you know, the EV maker has been able to uh, make a name for itself in terms of the EV space. So that is a very upbeat outlook that we're seeing. But of course, there are some risks to this. Uh, part of the Chinese auto dominance has also drawn concerns from its EU, its US rivals. And this week, of course, we've been seeing how EU China EV tariffs have been imposed. Pass. And of course, over in India, Maruti Suzuki in focus, disappointing somewhat. What are Alan saying about it? 
Yeah, net income misestimates. We saw profit falling 17%. Uh, the likes of Jefferies have downgraded it to sell. We still have 30 buy and 12 hold on the stock. Uh, I think what the issue for analysts was as far as the earnings scorecard was concerned was how uh, the growth for its entry level vehicle, a model if you like, that really wasn't coming through in terms of sales. And it speaks to a larger problem in India's auto industry. I mean, we saw this with Hyundai uh, India's IPO last week after it was trading at a discount in its market debut uh, compared to the issue price and these concerns about the growth of India's auto sector. And it's something that I think is coming through with the slowing consumer backdrop. Investors and consumers seem to be pulling back uh, when it comes to F&B spending and household goods not just uh, auto or asset uh, purchases. So this is what we're seeing in terms of the analyst recommendations, Haas. Still overwhelming buy for Maruti. Now, speaking of Maruti Suzuki India, as we said, it's reported lower than expected profit for the September quarter on weak domestic demand for cars. Let's get more on those results and the outlook with company chairman R.C. Bhargava joining Insight exclusively. Mr. Bhargava, good to have you with us. Despite the disappointment, you're pretty upbeat about 3 to 4 percent growth this year. What's driving that optimism? Well, firstly, I'd like to clarify that uh, this worry about the drop in the profit is, I think, somewhat misplaced because, as I had clarified in the press yesterday, this drop is a one-time result of the change in the budget which was uh, it took away the indexation benefit from the mutual funds. And it's not going to happen. Otherwise, we were actually higher profits. And I'm not sure why this one-time legal change is uh, having so much impact on the market. But that apart, I'm very optimistic about the future because the Indian economy is continuing to grow at 7 to 8 percent. There are people who think it can grow faster. And the automobile industry's future depends essentially on how the economy behaves. And if we have an economy which is strong, which is growing, then these temporary slowdowns in the automobile in a year or two years are not relevant to us. We, have, we look at it on a long-term basis. And I think India's future is long-term. Mr. Gava, Bhagava, if you're so optimistic, why are you predicting 3 to 4 percent growth? Why not higher? When might we see and what would it take for us to see higher single-digit growth? Well, it's a lower growth is happening because we are at a stage where we are also upgrading the quality of our cars in terms of both their emission and in terms of their safety standards. Now, when you upgrade cars in those respects, the cost of production of the car goes up. And that is what's been happening in the last three, four years, that uh, the lower end of the market, cars below rupees 10 lakhs, that's 1 million, have had a much higher impact of this upgrade than cars above uh, 1 million rupees. And that segment, which used to be 80% of the market, uh, five years ago, has actually been not growing, but declined a little bit. And the growth has been happening, this 3 to 4 percent growth of the total market has come from the upper segment, the 20 percent segment, which are people who are buying cars costing above 1 million. And I think this phenomenon mm -hmm. will continue for another year or so, till we are able to get the economy going and having an impact on the disposable incomes of people so that they can afford to buy cars even at these upgraded standards and higher costs. How about in terms of exports? We saw how uh, exports grew about 12 percent in the first six months. Can you repeat that performance? Can you outdo that performance? And which markets are important for you? Well, we are expecting uh, the export market to continue to strengthen. The forecast uh, which we, along with Suzuki, have made is that by 3031, our exports with this year will cross about 300,000, will reach maybe 750 to 800,000. We are exporting uh, to South America. Chile is one of the big markets. We're exporting to South Africa, Middle East. We've started exports to... Japan, 
very soon we will be exporting some electric cars to Europe. And uh, we are actually all over now. I think there is no particular country which I can name, but some countries are bigger than others. Mm, but are there new countries, new regions that you hope to bring your cars to? The electric cars to Europe is new because we were not exporting the uh, internal combustion cars to Europe uh, in the last couple of years. I think adding Europe this year will be a new thing in terms of the EVs. What's the goal? What's the target in terms of your EVs in Europe? Uh, we haven't fixed a target yet. Let's start selling. Let's see how the cars are accepted. And uh, depends on how the market reacts. We will then be able to give a better uh, figure on what we think we can export each year. Right, but how optimistic are you that your EVs will do well? It is a competitive market. It is about pricing. How do you see your car doing? We are obviously optimistic about the performance of our EVs. Suzuki has been working very hard on this. They have had some help from Toyota also. And we think that in terms of technology, our cars will be as good as any anywhere. Mr. Bhargava, you currently have 40% of the market. In the next perhaps three to five years, do you see yourself growing that market share? Uh, the market share will certainly grow as soon as the lower end of the market, what I said, the cars below 10, 1 million rupees start growing, which I said is a matter of time till it happens. Once that happens, our market share will certainly grow rapidly, and we hope that by 30, 31, 32, something around that time, we will certainly be back to 50 percent. Uh Despite the strategy that you have to grow, Maruti, when you take a look at your stock price, it's up about 7% year-to-date versus 12% uh, uh, for the benchmark index. Why do you think investors are not quite buying the story you're telling right now? You know, the behavior of uh, the market in terms of share prices is very hard to predict. And at times, the share price has gone up sharply. I don't, never had an explanation for that. Now it's gone down yesterday. I think that's a knee-jerk reaction for to that 17% drop in profits from what was expected by the analysts. But the analysts, I think, have got it a little bit uh, uh, wrong in terms of understanding that this drop was a one-time effect. It has nothing to do with annual operating in the, uh, the working of the company. Mm. Mr. Bhagavad, before we let you go, people talk about how India needs to localize its auto supply chain to perhaps uh, have less reliance on China. Where is India on that? And what's stalling that process? Our localization level is pretty high as far as Maruti is concerned. Uh, we need to work on localization of electric cars because once we start electric cars in a few months, the local content of that initially is going to be somewhat higher than what we would like. And uh, the challenge now going forward is how to quickly localize the electric cars, which means fundamentally the battery and the controller. Right. And uh, we are working on that. Suzuki is working on that. And I hope that uh, we will soon have some Mr. answers Bhagava? which we can, uh, yeah. R.C. Bhagava, we thank you so much for your insights today. Time for us to go. This is Bloomberg.